Hallelujah to your name, O God. We thank and we praise you, Lord. And we ask that you move in this place, O God. That your Holy Spirit will move, O Lord. That God, even as we continue to worship you, Lord, as we're fully attentive, God, to your word, Lord God, that you would speak to us. Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus, Lord, that we will recognize that you are God. And you are the Lord that has spoken and God, I pray that you would help us to realize what you've said. Help us to understand the word of the Lord today. Help us, Lord, to apply it to our lives, God. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would move as you give freedom in hearts, O oh God, to express their love for you. Father, we thank and praise you for what you're going to do, God. We humble ourselves before you, Lord, because without you, there's nothing that we can do, Jesus. We recognize that we are just a branch, but you are the vine. You're the one who gives us life. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to understand more of who you are through the miracles, Lord Jesus. That the lessons that we will experience, God, will transform us from the inside out, oh Lord. How we think, our attitudes, oh God, our intents, Lord. We ask that you, Jesus, will be number one. That you will be on the throne of our hearts and of our minds today. So thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do, Lord Jesus. Speak to us, we pray. Thank you for the power that's in the word of God. Open up our minds now, we ask, Lord. Open up our hearts and our spirits to receive the word of God today, that we will be different as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look at God's word together as the Lord leads us and guides us through the word of God as we look at our series, which is the lesson and the miracle. And today, when God calls you to do the impossible, when God calls you to do the impossible is what we're going to look at today. Now, we talked about the book of John being very unique. In fact, last week we talked about that. And then this week we're going to go into it even more so. Um, more of next week, sorry, rather than this week, because there are so there's so much application in regards to the Word of God that it's exciting in, as to what the Lord has. So much application into God's Word, so much lessons that are in this particular miracle, which is the feeding of the five thousand. Now, there's something that we need to recognize about this particular miracle. This is one of the miracles. That's in all four Gospels. The only other thing that's a miracle that's in all four Gospels is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the number one miracle. 
But other than that, right behind that is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 because this particular miracle was so significant to the life of Jesus Christ. In fact, you can imagine what it would have been like when there are 5,000 people that have experienced the miracle of God. Now, there are 5,000 men, first of all, that doesn't include women and it doesn't include the children. So by the time we had the women and the children, most scholars say that this is really the feeding of the 12 to 15,000. Can you imagine that? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, decided to feed 15,000 people in one setting. That's a miracle. That is a miracle. That's probably why it's in all of the four Gospels. This is not fictitious. Is not a parable. It's what really took place because God is the one who can create something out of little or something out of nothing. That's the power of God. So that's what's unique about this. There are seven miracles that John highlights in the entire book. And because Jesus Christ did many more miracles than this, if John is highlighting seven and he's writing the book to those of us who is the, is very the audience for the book, more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they were given to particular people groups, then how much more should we concentrate on these miracles that Jesus Christ has decided to include it by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle John so that we know exactly what took place in the feeding of the 5,000. So this is how it begins in chapter 6, verse 1. It says, sometime after this, there's stuff that took place in between of chapter 5 and verse the, the chapter 5 in the previous verses, 47, when you get to chapter 6 and verse 1, it says sometime after this. Some say maybe about a six-month period or so, but sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is called the Sea of Tiberias. Everyone say Tiberias. Tiberias is the Roman name for the Sea of Galilee. So it's important for us to recognize that because it helps us to realize that this was given to an audience that wasn't really Jewish, meaning the book of John wasn't really for the Jewish people. The book of Matthew was for the Jewish people. But this was a book mostly for everybody else. If they didn't fit into being a Jew or a Roman or a Greek, then this was the book for you to read. This was the book that summarized who Jesus Christ is and what we need to know about the life of Christ. For those that didn't have a whole lot of background, that's why he calls it the Sea of Galilee, but uses the Roman name for the sea, which is what most people would know, especially those under the Roman government, as the Sea of Tiberias. Why? Because Tiberius was the Caesar of the time, Tiberius. Caesar, so it was named after the emperor, the city that was right there by the Sea of Galilee, which was the capital city of Galilee, was Tiberius, named after the emperor, named in about A.D. 20, the year 20, and remember the, the king of this time is King Antipas or Herod Antipas, who took over from Herod the Great. So Herod the Great died, Herod Antipas took over, and he is the one who decides to name this area, Tiberias, and caused to see Tiberias because he respected and wanted to get on the good side of the emperor, of course, like most people wanted to do. So they call it the Sea of Tiberias. Geographically speaking, at the time of Jesus Christ, we can see the main area. So when you read your Bible, you're going to be either in Galilee or you're going to be in Samaria or you're going to be in Judea, Judea or in Perea or the Decapolis. These are the areas or the cities where Jesus Christ would be. So we're talking about Jesus Christ now going to the area of Galilee. Let's look at it again. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee that is Tiberias. So we're going to look a little bit and zoom into that area of Galilee, and we can see it a little bit better. And he talks about Tiberias, that's the city there. And also the north, northern, most northern part of the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias would most likely be Beth Beth Bethsaida. Bethsaida is the fish, fishing village and the place where he got his, most of his disciples from that were fishermen. 
So the fishermen guys joined him in this area as well. And now he has 12 disciples. So he's going to the area of Bethsaida. So as we zoom in quite a bit, you can see some places there in Israel. You see Tiberias. You can see where Cana is located. You see what Capernaum is. This is his capital where he was hanging out that he made sort of his headquarters. But most of the miracles of Jesus Christ were done around this lake, around this sea called the Sea of Galilee. It says, and a great crowd of people followed him. Why? Because they saw the signs. This is the miracles. Remember, John always calls them signs. Because he saw the signs, they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. So now Jesus Christ, if you can keep this in mind, the first couple of miracles were sort of done in sort of undercover. Remember that? The, the wedding there, and no one really knew except the guys who carried the jugs. And, of course, the word would get out, especially in a place called Israel. The second thing that took place is the second miracle. How many people remember that? what that was? That was last week. Hopefully you remember that one. Oh, no, the week before last. Anybody remember that? The official son that was healed, right? Remember that guy was probably from Tiberias. So the official, the nobleman's son who was healed, this guy who belonged to the Roman government. Interesting, because remember Herod Antipas was the one who beheaded John the Baptist. However, this guy, if he was a part of the same household, says, I don't care what the king has to say, my son has to get healed. The third one was last week, and what was that miracle? Yes, when he says to that man, you better get up and stop your complaining because of the things that God has in store for you. And now Jesus Christ, as he's continuing to do these miracles, especially for the time period in between, there are miracles that are taking place that John doesn't record. So he sort of fast forward from chapter 5 to chapter 6 and says the word in regards to Jesus is getting out. People are recognizing Jesus can do supernatural stuff. They couldn't deny the fact that Jesus could do miracles because he was doing them all of the time. And if you were living in Israel and this was taking place in your town in an area where nothing usually takes place, you would have come out too to check this thing out, wouldn't you? Let me check it out. This is what's taking place. A great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. A person sick immediately healed. And people were like seeing people being transformed and the grace and the power of God. It was a move. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside. Keep in mind that the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by mountains, okay? So there's mountains. The Sea of Galilee is surrounded by mountains. He went up on a mountainside there by the sea and sat down with his disciples. The, past, the Jewish Passover festival was near. So that's going to cause a lot of more people to come. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. You see, because the Passover is coming, and there will be hundreds of of thousands of visitors that are going to be coming all around Israel during this time. They're going to be going down to Jerusalem. And the best advertisement at this time in the first century is still some of the best advertisement today. And it's called word of mouth. So what Jesus is about to do is a miracle that's going to basically continue to help people to spread the fact. That he can do the impossible. That Jesus Christ is amazing. And this is what's taking place. So Jesus goes up on the mountains. He's just sitting down chilling with his boys. Chilling with the disciples. The Jewish festival was near. And then the word of God says this. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him. He said to Philip. Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He plants a seed in Philip's mind to say, how are we going to feed all of these people? Now, there's something that we need to recognize here, and this is what the Word of God says, is that Jesus Christ has 12 disciples at this time, doesn't he? Now, I'm going to need 12 men to help me out. So I need 12 men to come forward, please. Twelve men. Uh, 
Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Let's put our hands together for the men. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, you could layer up twice. Yeah, make two, 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 two lines, please. So we have 12 disciples. Where's Matthew? Thank you, Matthew. I'm glad you know your name. Can you put that on? I need James. There are two James. There's James, yes. I'm glad. See, two hands went up. You see that? These guys know who they are. There's two James in the Bible. There's James, the son of Zebedee, yes. By the way, this James, it's his birthday today. Say happy birthday. <laughs> I need Philip. You got to know who you are. Philip, here you go. You can put that on. I need Simon. That's Simon the Zealot. This Simon was no joke. He will cut you in a second. Praise the Lord that his saved. Thaddeus. Thank you, Thaddeus. Andrew. Bartholomew. You like that name, Bartholomew? That's a tongue twister. Peter. <laughs> I need Thomas. The Apostle John. <laughs> oh, yeah, you gotta be John. <laughs> Don't take this personal. Someone has to be Judas. <laughs> He's got the money. You need some money, check him out. So, notice what's taking place. These are 12 disciples, according to the Word of God, the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. It was a mixture of a crew, a guys who you wouldn't normally put together who are now together. Some of them are fishermen. One guy's a zealot, and then you got a tax collector. Tax collectors used to, um, zealots wanted to kill tax collectors. So, you got Matthew, who's a tax collector. You got Simon the zealot. These guys really wouldn't normally get along, but they're on the same team now because Jesus transforms people. You may be in church and be next to somebody who you wouldn't normally hang out with, but that doesn't matter because when you're part of the body and the family of Jesus Christ, color doesn't matter, background doesn't matter, none of that stuff matters. You belong to the Most High God. So now there's these 12 disciples, and they now have to be the ones who have to sort of find out something. So imagine what's taking place. Jesus Christ is up there chilling on the mountainside, sitting down with his disciples. And Jesus now... Where's Philip? Come out, Philip. It's like, you know what I'm saying? It's like Jesus does this. Where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? All these people that are coming. Thousands of them. Where are we going to buy bread? It's interesting he asks Philip because Philip is from Bethsaida. He's from the area. So it makes sense for him to ask Philip because that's where he's from. So where are we going to find? What are we going to find? How shall we find how shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Notice in Matthew's Gospels, this is what it says. As even approached, the disciples came to him and said, after he obviously said it to Philip, Philip didn't keep it to himself. Philip then goes to the other guy. Jesus just started with Philip. But Philip obviously went to the other guys and said, Jesus is, wants us to feed these people, wants me to go out and buy some food for these people. So he started telling all the other disciples. Yeah, he started telling all the other disciples. Yeah, he started telling all the other disciples. And so all the other disciples are murmuring amongst themselves. So you know what these guys say? They say, um, time out. You see, up to this point, they were excited because of the crowds. Because they never seen anything like this. These are fishermen. And now we got people. You know, we took some flack before. But now the people are coming out. People know who we are. This is exciting. Let's stay up here. Keep teaching Jesus. Keep teaching Jesus. You know, there's the teaching, the Sermon on the Mount already took place. So the crowd's building. And now 
all these people are coming up. Evening approached now. The disciples came to him and said, Master, this is a remote place. And it's already getting late. Send the crowds away. It's time for people to go home. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know how it is when you're at a party and you're just there and hanging out and somebody starts doing this? You know what that means, right? They're like, Jesus, flick the lights. These guys got to go. Why? Because now they feel the pressure that we need to feed people. What Jesus talking about? Let them go home. This is a remote place. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. In fact, it says, hurry up and send the people away because it's getting dark. And if you don't hurry up, and some of them are going to faint on the way. They are so exhausted and hungry because no one planned on staying that long. They were coming to see a miracle. But when Jesus was there and started teaching, they didn't want to leave. So they weren't prepared for this, you see. They didn't come with their lunch. They just came out to see something and then just kept following Jesus and said, check that out. So what he did? Yeah, let's go. Everybody saying, come on, check it out. It was like better than the gum base. Everybody was following him. <laughs> Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Now the pressure's worse. You want me to feed all these people? That's impossible. You ever seen a crowd of 10,000 people together? 10,000, 12,000 people. I remember when we put on the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, there was about 12, 11,000 people. At that time, one of the biggest events held in Bermuda, Jesus Christ drew a crowd. Can we say amen? That's the power of Jesus. 12,000. So imagine saying, okay, you got to feed all these people. I mean, the stadium was packed. The floors were packed. We rented every chair we could in the entire island to get chairs there and Tying them together based on fire department rules, there was eleven to 12,000 people present. That's the power of Jesus Christ. And now you want us to feed them? <laughs> I don't know about that. So where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. We're already at our first lesson. Whenever Jesus asks you to do the impossible, don't panic. He has a plan. When Jesus Christ asks you to do something that is totally impossible, don't fret, don't fear. God already has a plan. God has in mind what he's going to do. This is what we have to remember when we go through difficult situations. When you're faced with an impossible situation and you think, oh, no. That's the time when you can say, okay, God, I'm going to trust in you because obviously you know what you're doing. I entrusted myself to you. So, God, please lead me. God, please help me because I need to do whatever it is that you're calling me to do. He's going to call you at times to do what is impossible. Why? So when it happens, who can get the glory? You? Of course not. They're going to get the glory for feeding all those people? No possible way because they don't have what it takes. Philip said to Jesus, And says, it would. <laughs> Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wage to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Did you get that? It's going to take half a year's wages. It says 200 denarii. That's like six months pay to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. They're not even going to get full. They're six months. So how is it going to take how many? Two years wages to feed all these people? Jesus, please, please send them home. It's time to go. Tell them it's time to go. It's amazing how Jesus Christ is, right? If we look to our own resources instead of God, we'll always see the problem instead of the provision. Whenever we look to our own resources, when God asks you to do something and you look to yourself, then you will always fall short and think there's no sense even starting. There's no sense even stepping out. Why? Because you're looking at your own resources instead of the resources of God and what God can do. Because God can do the impossible. 
That's how awesome the Lord is. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's Peter brother, Andrew, Andrew. Now, Andrew, this is Simon Peter's brother. And, you know, Peter was spontaneous, right? Andrew was sort of the same way. So Andrew takes it amongst himself because Jesus said, maybe we should go and just check and see, you know, what we have. See what's out there. So all the disciples probably go and go searching. You can go, can go, check out, see if anybody's got anything. Can't dial for four star because it ain't no phones. So Gasso can't arrive in this remote area. We don't even have a signal. Like, what are we going to do in regards to the fact that there's nobody? Gentlemen, the people are in the crowd. The people are that way. You got to go to the crowd and look for the people. There's no food back there. You got to see what's out there. Yes, thank you. See what's out there. No, bubble gum and candy don't do. That's not going to help. Sugar high. Oh, Andrew comes back. Simon's Peter's brother. Yeah. Here is a boy that has five small loaves and two fishes. Oh, you looked into his lunch kit? Okay, so here's a small little boy. A boy's lunch, the word of God says. Here's a boy with five small body loaves and two small fish. But what does he say at the end? But how can they? But how far will they go among so many? Too many people. What are we going to do? All these people? And this is all you could find? Was this boy's lunch? Now, there's something we need to realize. When they talked about how many people were there, they said it's what? 5,000 what? 5,000 men. They didn't even count the women. Didn't even count the children. And it's just the boy who has some food. It's interesting, isn't it? God uses the people that others don't count. Like us. People that others pass by, God calls you. God counts and uses the people that other people don't count. Because they think, what does he have to offer us? That's just a little boy. That was the thoughts in the first century. The same thing with seniors. They disregarded seniors and they disregarded children. But this boy has a lunch and this is all we got. So the boy comes up and brings his lunch. Thank you, little boy. Let's give him a hand. So if we look at this lunch that this boy brings that Andrew decides to bring up. And all we find in here is a boy's lunch. There is what's called barley loaves. These are small little loaves about this size. Barley loaves, five of them that are here. Five barley loaves and then two small fish by the size of sardines. That's all we got. This is the best that we could do. But how far can this go? Um, well, Jesus told him, go see what you got. So you got to come back and bring whatever you got. Jesus says, okay. Five small barley loaves and two small fish. If you don't recognize what you have, then you won't experience the miracle of multiplication. You see, if you disregard this, then you miss out on all of that. This is what Jesus Christ is helping the people to understand. That seems so insignificant. But if you can bring your little insignificant whatever you have to Jesus, then Jesus can do something with a little. But he has decided not to do something with nothing. So he wants whatever you have, whatever you have left, whatever you have left in regards to all that you've been through in life, all of the difficult situations, all of the trials, and you feel like you're just holding on. Bring whatever you have left to Jesus and watch Jesus multiply it. 
Because if you keep waiting on the big breakthrough and the big this and the big that in order to supply the other areas of your life, you will never get there. Just bring whatever you have, your brokenness, your little bit of what seems to be so insignificant, your limited education, whatever the situation may be, bring it to Jesus Christ and watch him do something great. So this is what's so awesome about God. You don't need a whole lot of stuff for God to do something great. He just wants all of whatever you have. This little boy, most times we look at the feeding of the 5,000, we just concentrate on the miracle itself, but we never look at the source. The source was this little boy, for whatever reason, wherever he was going, his mama decided to give him some lunch. And because of the fact that this little boy loved to eat and had to have his meal at lunchtime, it's the only reason why we see this miracle take place. Because they searched the whole crowd. No one was prepared for this. No one, except the boy's little lunch. Jesus says, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. Don't worry, disciples, I haven't forgotten you. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down, about 5,000 men were there. So disciples, you can have a seat. But later on, I'm going to be calling you back, okay? To have a seat for now among the people. As you go there, make sure that they all sit down. But the word of God gives us more insight for the people who have to sit down. In Luke's gospel, it says, but he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of what? 50 and even 100. In another gospel, in groups of 50 and 100, the disciples sits, did so and everybody sat down. Now, you've got to realize something. We're talking about how many people again? 5,000 men, but probably how many? 12 to 15,000 people. Imagine 12 guys... Having to get 12 to 15,000 people sit down in groups of 50. Can you imagine that? Think about that for a second. That's going to take some time, wouldn't you think? It's going to take some time for that to take place. It shows, yes, God is a God of decency and order and all of that stuff. But the reality also is another lesson. The best miracles in your life take some time. It wasn't just like bring it here and he breaks it and boom, the food goes out. You would have chaos on your hands if you do that, if you just give out food. Sister Twiggy has a very kind heart. And I remember one time we were in Zambia. And the rule was, whatever you do, don't give out any food. Sister Twiggy. There was a boy who must have caught her eye. And she was there, and she decided just to give him, what was it, an egg or a piece of bread or something. And before we knew it, there was a riot that was, what happened? What happened? What went on? Sister Twiggy was like, oh, no. What happened, Sister Twiggy? What did you do? I just gave the boy some food. Remember the rule. Don't give it, because you have chaos. So what had took place? The guy says, in groups of 50, in groups of 100, it's a lesson for us in this. When God's about to do a miracle in your life, there's some preparation that's needed in order to receive it. You know, one of the greatest dangers is to get a great blessing from God prematurely. A premature blessing from God can destroy you. So what Jesus has decided to do is sometimes he has given you a promise in regards to a miracle or a blessing or something that is going to do in your life. And it seems like his just taken so long in order for it to take place. I want to encourage you that usually the problem isn't with God. Sometimes it's just God is waiting for us to fall in alignment with whatever he's already told us to do so that the blessing can come. Because if you get the blessing too early, the blessing can become a curse. So as a result, it takes some time in order for these people to get in line, 50s, groups of 50s, groups of 100. And people must have been wondering, well, how long is this going to take? Now we have to keep something else in mind, as it says here. They, there was a grass, it says it was a huge grass area. There's a reminder here that these people are hungry. That's a whole different situation. Some of them are about to faint if they even started the journey. Have you ever been really 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 hungry some of you say yes every day but this is real hunger like they are so hungry and you know when there's a lot of people and they're hungry 
People get miserable, don't they? Some of you are like that. You may be looking all nice and neat in church talking about this is a move. But if you don't get fed, there's going to be some heads that are going to move, right? <laughs> These people are hungry. And they still have to wait on Jesus. Have you ever been hungry for something in your life other than food? And you're waiting on Jesus Christ. It just goes to show that just because you have a driving need, it doesn't override the time for divine preparation. For God to cause things to take place in your life. For you to fall in alignment with what God has for you. You have to wait and trust in God and get some things in order in regards to your life. And then God says, even though I know you have the need, even though I know you want it so bad, trust me and depend on me and do the things that I've already told you to do and prepare yourself so the blessing can come. And watch God do something great. We attract people in the Bible. They all, Joseph is a prime example of this. He knew based on the dreams and the vision that God had given him, which was prophetic, that you will run, they rule people, and you will be, leadership was his gift. And it's going to happen. It surely didn't seem like it when he was there in Potiphar's household scrubbing those floors. Or when he was in that prison for something that he didn't do, even though the promise was already given even though he probably wanted to exercise this gift and seemed to just come out everywhere he went, whether it was Potiphar's house or the prison, but yet it wasn't until he was given at 17, but it wasn't until he was, what, 29 years old that it actually becomes a reality. David is another example, isn't he? Anointed the king at 17, doesn't become the king until he's about 30 years old. Just because you have a driving need doesn't override the time for divine preparation, trust in God. Je Jesus then took loaves and gave thanks and distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. In John's gospel, it says he took the loaves and gave thanks. But we know what really happened. Luke gives this account and others that he took the loaves and the fish and looking up into heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them. So he has given thanks for this little boy's lunch. And is lifting this up into heaven and saying, God, thank you, and giving thanks to God. Another reminder, right? Give God thanks with whatever little you have. Don't be always complaining about what you don't have. And that is really one of the greatest temptations of life. The greatest temptation of life is always to look at what you don't have instead of what God has already given you. To be miserable over the fact. That things aren't how you want it to be because this isn't happening and that isn't happening. And you get upset and forget all of the blessing that God has already given you. And so we need to recognize the small things that God has blessed us with. This is really a big thing when God is in it. And so now it takes place where they lift this up and he gives thanks to God. But then he says, and he broke them. The blessing was in the breaking. For those who have been blessed and for those who know that they've been blessed and are fully sold out for Jesus Christ, I can guarantee you this. You've been broken. You've gone through difficult situations. And there are some people that don't understand what we're talking about because they haven't been through it yet. They haven't gone through a hard time yet. But you know Jesus Christ to be real because you've been through that difficult, most hard time in your life. And somehow you got to the other side because of God. The blessing, we could put our hands together and thank God. The blessing of abundance comes out of your broken insufficiency. You know what God's looking for more than sophisticated people? You know what he really looks for? Broken people. People that have been through something. People that have been through some hard times. Those who have had their health threatened and have lost loved ones and know what it's like to mourn and to go through a difficult situation. That's the type of people that he calls. That's the type of people that he looks for. Then Jesus took the loaves and he broke them and gave thanks, broke them and distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. He distributed them. But how did he distribute them? Luke tells us taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them. Then he gave them to the what? The disciples. To do what? 
distribute them to the people. Remember, he said, I want you to give them something to eat. You feed them. He doesn't, Jesus Christ doesn't directly feed the people. He is the source of the miracle. But then he takes the miracle and he gives it to all of the 12 disciples and says, okay, guys, you go out to all of the groups that you just laid out there and now you feed the people. Jesus Christ is the source, but not the one who feeds, which is another reminder for us as you mature in Christ, your focus changes from what others should do for you to what you can do for others. This is maturity. A shift takes place from a consumer mentality to a servant mentality. Most people join a church based on the services that the church offers them. Based on what they like about the ministry, it's what they get out of it. But as we mature in Christ, it's not so much what we get out of it, it's what we put in it. So God is going to draw you as you mature in Jesus Christ, not just to be someone who sits there, but who actually be someone who gets involved. Because as you grow, it's not what others do for you. It's now, what can I do for other people? He's helping his disciples to realize that we are not here for these crowds to serve others us we're here to serve the crowds so i want you to go and i want you to feed the people just like i said you give them something to eat who would have ever thought that god would have did it that way and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted he did the same with the fish so for those who are receiving this is something we need to remember you must learn to receive god's blessings even if it comes through other people if you're the type of person that knows Jesus, I want you to give it to me directly. God can be trying to give you a blessing through somebody else. But because you're not receiving it, because you feel that that person isn't worthy, it could even be a word of instruction or a blessing that God's going to use in your life. God even used a donkey in the word of God. He can use anybody to get his word across to you. And there are times in your life in which God will bring a blessing to you and it's coming from God, but it's coming through somebody else. You have to have a heart to receive what God wants to bless you with. How many say amen to that? Sometimes it can come up in the form of a way. But if you say, no, it's just Jesus and me and I only want Jesus to, well, you might miss out on the blessing of God. This miracle continues when they had all had had enough to eat. He said to his disciples, if the disciples can please come forward. Again, thank you very much. Join me back on the stage, please. And he wanted them to gather the pieces that are left over and let nothing be wasted. Isn't this interesting? Jesus wants the leftovers. Jesus wants the leftovers. It's interesting that this is awesome because the people had enough to eat. After they were full. You know when you're full, you don't want any more food, right? You know what that feeling's like when you get full and you're like, you don't get tempted. You know, the best time, let me give you some advice. The best time for you to go to the supermarket to purchase groceries is after a meal when you're already full. Because you know what it's like when you go there hungry, right? Oh, I need that and I need this. And you're just like eating, feeding your stomach in your imagination because of what you think you need. The best time to go is when you had something in your stomach. So what happens is that these people don't want any more food. So what happens is that Jesus Christ says, no, I want you to gather the pieces that are left over and let nothing be wasted. Let nothing be wasted. So you know what these guys do? They go all through the crowd and they collect what's left over, the broken pieces of this and the broken this. Okay, I need that. Yes, thank you. Yes, you know what I'm saying? Can you imagine that? The senior that was there who had her foil. Nope, lady, put that away. We need to take the leftovers. We need all the leftovers. They bring all of the leftovers in, right? Bring all of the leftovers. Sister, I see it in your purse. I need the bread. I need the bread. And they get it all in, right? So this is what takes place.
Can you imagine? The word of God tells us that they go through the crowd. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. There's an abundance with Jesus Christ. The word El Shaddai means the one who gives in abundance. So the one who is in abundance means the one who is the abundant God. God doesn't just give you enough for yourself. He gives you an abundance that's left over. And all of these guys, most of them started to form a coalition against Jesus to say, send the people home, Jesus. Listen to us. We know what we're talking about. Philip's like, I'm from this area. It ain't no food like that out here. It's getting dark. Can you send the people home? No, you give them something to eat. And there are 12 baskets with pieces of barley that are left over. Because in this time period, if you're going to collect leftovers, you need a basket. That's what they had. If you're over the age of 60, you carry foil. I'm going to tell you what they do. They prepare for it. They prepare for it. Who? The premier's brunch. And they slip it in the purse. And they act like they don't know nothing. <laughs> Until it's time to go. If you're under the age of 40, you bring a Ziploc bag. <laughs> but everybody's looking for a little bit of leftover, right? So it's like, what am I going to do? So what happens is that there's baskets for leftovers. And we know what leftovers are like, right? Leftovers taste better, depending on the type of leftover it is, like soup. Oh, the next day, when all of that goes... You know what I'm talking about, right? Leftovers get better in some cases. So they gathered them 12 baskets full that were left over. Because you receive an abundance of blessings when you serve other people. They can't ex couldn't have experienced this unless they served the people. But because they served the people, they got blessed in the process. But what's even probably more important of this is that remember what Philip said? It would take more than six months' wages. We don't have the food for this. Send the people home. Okay, it's time to go. Jesus, got to let the people go. Jesus said, see what you have. They come back with a boy's lunch. And those who thought that Jesus, this is an impossible situation. Why does he allow 12 basketfuls left? So that every disciple can have a basket. To say, as they're walking away from the scene... Follow me, please, disciples. With Jesus Christ, as they're walking away from the scene, holding their basket, looking down at their basket, saying, we should have trusted Jesus. We should have just trusted him. Look at this. Unbelievable. I saw it. Andrews especially saying, I saw those five loaves and those two fish. If only we trusted in Jesus. We should have just trusted in Jesus. But why does God give you a basket? The basket is a reminder of what the Lord has done in the past so that you can trust him for what's to come in the future. You will lose the battle before you if you don't learn from the battle behind you. The basket is the reminder that Jesus Christ is the one who fulfills everything. You can stand right over here in the front. The basket is the reminder that Jesus Christ did something great. Why? Because the Lord has it where they are about to enter a storm. But they have a basket in the boat as a reminder of what Jesus did with the feeding of the 5 to 12 to 15,000. So if Jesus Christ did it before, then surely he can do it again. The reason why you have to remember stuff and have to have a reminder is you have to have a basket in your life. In that basket is filled with the miracles that Jesus Christ has already done. Is your reminder that, God, you have already done this for me last year. So now that I'm faced with another dilemma this year that shows up in a different size and a different package. But I know for a fact that you can get me through because you got me through before. 
So God, I'm going to trust in you and not give in to the pressure of getting fearful, of getting upset, of getting frustrated because I'm dealing with something that's new. You see, there are always going to be new trials in life, new pulls on your life, new demands on your life. So you got to seek God and say, God, is this a demand that you want me to fulfill, first of all? But as God is calling you to do something that's impossible, you have to remember what God has already done. You have to keep a memory basket of the blessings of God so when the next battle takes place, you have some history. You pull back and say, you did it before. God, I'm going to trust you to do it again. So I'm going to lean on you, God, and trust you and depend on you. Imagine what God has brought you from. Think about it for a second. What has God delivered you from? What has God healed you from? What has God caused your heart to be captured back to him when you are going away from him? Imagine that and then say, God, if you did it before, surely you can do it again. So I just need to remember, I need to remember and hold on to my basket. Let's thank our disciples. You can rest the basket right on the stage for me. After the people saw the sign performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. This is the prophet. Surely this is the guy. This is the guy that Moses talked about. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 50, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses said, from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And they thought, surely this is the guy, this is the prophet that Moses talked about. There was an argument that took place before this whole experience, and that was among the teachers of the law. Remember that? When the miracle that Jesus Christ did last week, when he told that man, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And the guy was like, well, I don't know who did it. And they realized it was Jesus Christ because the guy went back and told the leader, hey, it was Jesus that changed my life. And then after he goes back and tells him, hey, Jesus is the one who transformed me. Jesus Christ said this in John chapter 5, verses 45 to 47. But you talking to these religious leaders, but do you think I will accuse you before the father? Your accuser is Moses on whom your hopes are set. If you believe Moses... You would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So Jesus Christ is saying that Moses is the one who already to told about me. This is why they're saying, this is the prophet. This must be the guy. So Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. They were going to make him king right there and right then. Jesus says, no, no, no. This is not how I'm going to be king. These guys ain't going to make me king. There's no way. And remember, Jesus already knows what's in the heart of people. This is something we all have to remember. The people who want to make you king today may want to crucify you tomorrow. You can't entrust yourself to people. You need to entrust yourself to God. I know full well that's a fact. Learn to call on God to protect you after your greatest blessings. Jesus Christ is not given into that and the allocates of the people and the 15,000 people that are like, yeah, this is the guy. This is the king that's going to deliver us from the king Antipas. This is the king of the Jews. Let's celebrate him and make him king by force. We're going to make you king. You ain't going nowhere. Jesus Christ said, let me get out of here. Slipped away and goes on a mountainside to do what? To pray. The disciples with their baskets are going to a boat. Jesus Christ says, you guys go. I need some time alone with God. Why? Because some of the greatest blessings in your life can open up some of the greatest attacks of the devil. So you need to pray. Some of the greatest successes in your life can lead to self-sufficiency and therefore pride. So you got to go and get grounded. You get grounded when you spend time alone with Jesus and say, God, please help me, protect me, and guide me, and help me to keep trusting in you because this blessing is so great. Trust in him. Depend on him. 
and know that as Jesus Christ did it for the 5 to 10 to 12 to 15,000 people, he can do it for you. Trust in Jesus Christ and allow him to be the one who guides you, who leads you, so that you can be the one to realize that when God calls you to an impossible situation, you realize it's not about you. It's about what God wants to do. It's about what God can accomplish. It's about trusting in him and leaning on the Lord and depending on him because he does great and mighty things. He has the spirit of God that wants to guide you and wants to lead you because he knows more than you do. So trust him. I remember when we were in Zambia, that song sort of reminded me of Zambia, even though I think that song was Nigerian. But in Zem, in uh, actually Kenya, we were in the Maasai Mara, and we had to go on a long journey. A long journey, like four hours in a truck that was, you know, bunks and up and down. I remember Belle was there. Belle was actually pregnant at the time, and we were going on this just praying over that baby. Let's, let's make it through this. And then Jordan was there. I believe Cody was there and others. And so we were there and Dalen and other young people. And so we're on this long journey and going. And then all of a sudden, uh, it's like four hours up. And then we did this ministry for a period of time for the most of the day. And then we had to head back for four hours. But we were trying to hurry up and get back before it got dark. Because remember, we're in the Maasai Mara. The Maasai Mara is the home of the animals. Like this is the home of the lions and the uh, panthers, black panther, and the uh, elephants and the wildebeest and all the wild animals. So we didn't necessarily want to do a night safari for four hours you know, going back to where we have to stay. But that's almost what took place. So we're going and we're moving along and we're driving. And these guys, they know this area like the back of their hands. The lights are on the truck. It's totally dark. There's no natural light whatsoever. You could probably see the stars if we looked up. It's completely dark. And there are wild animals there. The hippos, by the way, come out to feed at night. So you got to make sure you don't hit them. They're huge. Like a hippo is... Like the width of a hippo is about the width of this television. They're huge. And that's one thing you realize about uh, animals is how big they are. And so you see these things and you're avoiding them and he's just driving through and everything's fine. And then all of a sudden you just felt like a noise. like And wondering, what in the world is that? A stampede. This was like Lion King part three. A stampede of wildebeest was like coming. And we could see this huge shadow coming in the distance. And they're coming and headed right for the truck. These drivers in the truck, we probably had a few of them. The drivers in the truck. Were you there, Tony, at that time? The driver, Tony, was there. The drivers in the truck just stopped the truck and switched off the lights. And we're thinking, what are you doing? <laughs> Floor the truck, turn on the lights so we can see. At least turn on the lights so they can see us so they don't hit us. And here we are in complete still, petrified, and the wildebeest are coming for the truck. And they're headed right for the truck. And I want to tell you, it was, cr it was like, the, imagine this is the truck. The wildebeest are like coming and parading for the truck. And as they come to the truck, they do this. And avoid the truck until... Whatever, how many of them, I don't know if it was 50, 60, 70, 100 of them, until they all pass. Guy turns back on the lights, starts driving the truck again. Everybody all right? <laughs> yeah. What happened? He says, I have to stop. I have to turn off the lights. Because if I leave the lights on, they're not going to see us. The light's going to blind them. So they have night vision. So I have to turn off the lights to the truck and stay still so they can see us. They will avoid us, but we have to do that in order to survive. If not, it would have been a slaughter on the field with us. You know what I'm saying? Because they would have hit us and trampled over us. And this is an open truck. This is not like the, the beast that the president goes in. This is an open truck. You have a God 
who understands things that you don't. If the Holy Spirit is the one who guides us, then shouldn't we fall under the guidance of the Holy Spirit even when we don't understand what he may exactly be doing at the time? Shouldn't we trust him and depend on him to know that if his, we seem to be in a dangerous situation and he seems to be making it worse because he seems like he switched out the lights on you and it seems like, oh no, he doesn't care. He's going to let me totally die in this situation. And what he's doing is actually saving your life and protecting you and guiding you. Why? As that person who is that person who guide us in the truck knew more than we did. He understood the situation that he was in. Likewise, that's what the Holy Spirit is for you. He understands what you don't and wants you to trust in him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord. For the reality, Lord, that you guide us and for the miracles that you do. And I ask Jesus that you would help us to trust, to depend on you. No matter what the situation, as the musicians please come. No matter what we go through, God, we pray in Jesus' name that we would trust you, that we would depend on you, that we would lean on you. So God, for everyone that's going through something today, and you call us to do something that seems impossible, help us to know that you already have in mind what you're going to do. Help us to realize, oh God, that sometimes there are difficult situations that you lead us in because you want to be the one who gets the glory and the credit when you pull us out. Lord, I pray, God, that you will help us to realize that the resources don't come from us, that they come from you in our lives. The breakthroughs come from you. There's preparation that takes place in our hearts before the miracle takes place. So, God, for those who are waiting on their miracle, help them to keep trusting and depending on you, O oh God. And, Father, I pray, Lord, for those who are going through a situation where they feel as if you have forgotten them, God. Help them to realize that you are in complete and total control. And, Father, I pray that you will help us to realize that as you do the miracle and as you accomplish what you want done, help us to hold on to the basket of blessing, the basket of remembrance. So when we're faced with the next battle, we wouldn't lose it because we forgot the previous one. Help us to continue to trust in you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, God, to realize that when we experience your blessings, help us not to allow the blessings to draw us away from you, the one who loves us so much, the blesser. God, we thank you and we praise you. And we ask, God, that as you bring us back next week for the next miracle, and the lessons that we will learn, that you will help us to apply the ones that we learned today. Just right where you are, we're not going to call anyone forward today, but you say, God spoke to me today, and I want to apply his word. Just stand wherever you are. I want to apply the word of God. Maybe it's remembering what you, God brought you from. That's what I want to remember, God. Maybe it's the fact that you multiply, that I need to stop looking at all of the stuff that's not working and thank you for the stuff that is. That's the boy's lunch. You can look at what you don't have and miss the lunch. Maybe that's what you're missing in your life, the boy's lunch. Or you need to humble yourself in order to re receive from others. Whatever the situation is, God spoke to you. Father, for each person that's standing, I pray a special blessing on their lives. I pray, God, that you would encourage them to trust in you, to depend on you, and to lean on you, God. To know that you are the Holy Spirit. That when you shut the lights off of the truck, that you are still in control and you know what you're doing. So, Father, every time that we complain, help us to realize that it's saying, God, you are not God in my life, and you can't do what you said you're going to do. No wonder you took people out for complaining and murmuring in the desert. But, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be a thankful people and say, thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do. Thank you, Jesus, for the hard time. Thank you, Jesus, that you're going to get me through this situation. Thank you, Jesus, for the healing. You realize, Jesus... Lifted up that boy's lunch and thank him. Thank the Lord even before it got the miracle came. Another lesson for us, right? Praise God and thank God for the healing. Praise God and thank God for the blessing even before you receive it. That's what you taught us to do, Jesus. 
So, Father, I pray that you will help us to keep trusting and depending upon you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your love, and we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name. Can we all put our hands together and praise God? Come on, let's really praise the Lord God Almighty. Let's give him the glory that he deserves today. Come on, let's continue. We praise you, God, for your grace. We thank you that you're going to get us through every situation. Hallelujah to your name, O oh God. We glorify you and give you glory. Amen. Praise God. Encourage somebody before you go. Brooklyn Tabernacle is going to take us out of the building today. Let's worship the Lord together. Good morning. We're now going to have online giving. We thank God for those of you who have given thus far to our church. And uh, we're going to pray today that whatever you give online, that God will use that to the building up of the church. And so let us pray. Dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ today, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, oh God, for everything that you have supplied for us. And so, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, even as we give today, I ask in the name of Jesus that it will be used to the building up of your kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that even as we give, oh God, that you will continue to supply for us our every need, that whatever we ask for in the name of Jesus Christ, it will be done. And so today, once again, we give you thanks. Because as you supply for us, O oh God, we're able to give unto your kingdom. I pray, O oh God, that you'll bless every hand that gives today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you once again because you are God. Amen and amen. Thank you for being part of an awesome service. I hope you've enjoyed our time with us this week. We look forward to what God is going to do with us next week. Stay tuned to Grace Point. Look out for the notices. We're so awed by and thankful for your presence, and we look forward to what He's going to continue to do in and through your lives. Thank you so much for being a part of Grace Point 